Here we are on the front of our 220ML Bullet by Keystone. We're going to do a technical walkthrough like your technician did on the date of delivery. Some of your components may vary in brand, so if we don't touch on your specific brand of component, you can find more information on our YouTube channel for Great American RV under the Helpful Hacks playlist. And you can search for that particular component. Those will also go into a deeper dive of these components and other components with troubleshooting tips and other information. So let's go ahead and start in the front here. We have our seven-way plug. Our seven-way plug is going to be plugged into our towing vehicle. This is going to transfer all of our lights, our brakes, and our also a battery charge line that's going to pull from your alternator and your battery on your vehicle to help charge the battery that's here on your trailer while you're traveling down the road. We also have our breakaway switch. This cable needs to have a lanyard on it and hook to the receiver hitch on your truck. You don't wanna attach it to your tow chains or anything like that. The purpose is if the hitch or anything fails, this pin is gonna pull out with the cable and it will activate the brakes on your camper and bring it to a stop. We also need to make sure that we have a good charged 12 volt battery while we're traveling down the road Otherwise, these brakes won't activate in the event that an emergency happens. Also on the front here, we have our 12 volt powered tongue jack. This tongue jack operates by the push of a button. You also have a light up here. If you follow the power cord all the way back to the battery, you will likely find an inline fuse. In the event that this jack isn't operating, you wanna check that first and see if that is blown. You also wanna check your battery power to ensure that you have a proper 12 volts to operate it. If you can't get it operated, there's a black cap right here on the back. We pull that black cap off, we put our handle in there, and we can manually operate that jack. And that we have our dual propane tanks. They have a dual propane tank regulator. How that operates is you have a selector valve. You either choose the left tank or the right tank. You'll have both of them on. Whatever tank you have chosen with that selector switch, it will pull off of that tank until it runs dry and the indicator will give you a red signal showing that that tank is empty, but the secondary tank will pick up the flow and you will use off of that tank until it runs dry as well, giving you the indicator that it's empty and you need to fill it up. Behind that, we have our battery box for our battery as well as a battery disconnect. That battery disconnect is for when we store our unit unplugged. We want to go ahead and turn it to the off position so the camper isn't pulling off of that battery when you have it stored not in use. If you are plugging your unit in and storing it, you want to leave that battery disconnect on so our converter will charge our battery. On our driver's side, we have our solar on the side plug-in. This is for our solar system. We do have a controller already here in this front compartment. That controller is going to convert our solar power into charging power for our battery system. So we plug in a solar panel right here. This is for if we're, we're under trees or anything, if we have a solar panel on the roof, we can take this panel and put it out in the actual sunlight if we're covered by shade and we can still charge our battery when stored or out camping. Also in this front compartment, we have our inverter prep. That means our unit is pre-wired for an inverter. An inverter changes 12 volt battery power into 110. To be able to plug in like a coffee pot, TV, or charge your phone if you are out camping and you don't have a outlet to be able to plug your main power into. This will only last as long as we have voltage on that battery. Our solar system will help charge up that battery, but it may not keep up depending on what components you are operating. We also have our RV solar panel disconnect. That disconnect is different from our battery disconnect. It will completely shut off the solar power charging system on your unit. So if you don't want your solar running, you can go ahead and cut it off. But once again, if you are storing your unit unplugged, you wanna leave that disconnect on so that solar will charge your battery while it is sitting. If you, of course, have it in the sunlight or you choose that solar on the side with a separate panel. In here, we also have our Lippert Tire Link system. Our Lippert Tire Link system is a pre-wired sensor in here. You would have to purchase the package where it has the Bluetooth connection and the sensors to be able to in connect one of the tires, and you can monitor the temperature and air pressure on your tires. Once again, pre-wired, you would have to purchase the setup to upgrade on here. In your front compartment right here, we have our control center for our water, our cable, and our winterization stuff. Let's take a look at that. So here we have our control center in that front compartment. Up top, you'll see our key TV system. 
This system is where we'll hook up our park cable if they have one or our external satellite system right here. We'll look on the inside where these things go and how it operates. This power light right here indicates that we do have 12 volt power to that key TV system so it is operating and doing what it needs to do. Now below that we do have our outdoor water faucet or shower hookup. We have a quick connect right here. We put that male fitting in and we can lock it in. We have hot and cold water. We can put a shower head faucet on here or a sprayer and we'll have that outside water. To disconnect, push that ring in and it pops right out. To our right here, we have our extend and retract. This is for our stabilizer jacks, LCI stabilizer jacks. These are not intended to level your unit. They're only to stabilize your unit. If we wanna level our unit, we'll use the stacker blocks that you can purchase and we put, wanna put them under our tires and level our unit from left to right, depending on the slope of the pad that we are putting our camper on. Once we have that leveled out left to right, we'll use our tongue jack to level our unit from front to back. Once your unit is level, you'll come to the stabilizer jacks, you'll run your jacks down, and you wanna touch the ground and a little bit more after that. You don't wanna put a ton of weight on it because it will cripple those jacks and make them bend and break, and warranty does not cover that type of damage. This switch below that operates our underglow lights right near our stabilizer jacks. We can see outside under there that that will operate that. And here we have our satellite prep. If we have a satellite dish installed on our roof, this can come from there and hook up to our satellite right here on our key TV system. Here we have our fresh water tank connection. We'll take our water hose and we can put it in there and fill our fresh tank. We can monitor the level of that by our meter on the inside, we'll touch on later. This is for if we are dry camping. We don't have a city water connection to hook to, so we'll pull from our fresh tank by initiating our 12 volt water pump. Now we can drain this tank out, that's gonna be that blue line that's just under our unit, we'll look at in a little while. And we wanna drain it out when we're not using that water, we don't need it. Number one, it saves weight on our unit when we're traveling. And number two, that water is gonna get stagnant after a while. So we don't wanna leave it in there if we don't need it. To the right here, we have our city water connection. This is if we do have a water hose hook up at the campground or wherever we're staying, we hook the water line up to here and that will give us water pressure to all of our fixtures. Below that, we have our winterization valve. This valve is only gonna be used when we are winterizing our unit and we'll turn to there to that on position, and we'll use this knob right here to pump antifreeze into our system. More information on winterization is available in your owner's manual or one of our videos in the helpful hack section. Down at the bottom, we have our black tank flush. Just know right now, this is where that's located. We'll go over the operation of that black tank flush when we hit our sewage valve in the rear. You also have a cap down here at the bottom that you can pull off and that is where your lines will come in in order to run all of your water and cable and everything else. Behind our front compartment, we have our Girard tankless water heater system. This is an on-demand water heater system, gas powered. It's only gonna come on whenever we activate our hot water line and it will give us constant hot water for as long as we run it. We'll go over the controls and how this operates when we get inside. Down below here, we have a single blue water line. That water line has a valve on the end of it. That is to drain out the fresh tank that we talked about here in our control center. You'll notice up here on the side wall of your slide out, you do have a vent. It has two tabs right here to open it up. You wanna keep that closed when you're storing your unit and open if you use that vent above your stove top. So we notice on the rear of our unit at the bottom, we have our sewage connection. This is where we'll hook that sewage line to the port at the campground. And we have our black and gray tank valves right here. This is our black tank. This is our gray tank also labeled on the wall just above it. Our black tank holds our sewage from our toilet. That is gonna be our toilet paper, our sewage, and any water we put down there. We shouldn't be putting anything else besides those items in there and RV toilet paper only. Now, important thing about our black tank is we need to keep this valve closed all the time unless we're dumping. If we don't, then our tank will end up having dry tank. Any sewage, toilet paper, anything that gets in there, that tank is gonna dry it up because we have no water in there and it's impossible to clean. So wanna keep that valve closed and keep a couple of gallons of water in there, even when not in use. And our chemicals, of course, as well. So when we're ready to drain that out, we have our sewage hose hooked up to our connection at the campground. 
we pull that black tank valve and that's going to drain out our system. When we are done, we want to hook up our black tank flush hose there in the front control center that we talked about. And then that is a spray port inside our black tank that's going to help flush it out. We leave that valve open, let it flush out. We can close it for about 60 seconds or so, let a little bit of water build up, then open that valve and flush it out again. We do that several times until our meter on the inside lets us know that system is empty. And when we are done, we close that valve off. We can go to our toilet and just push the valve there and put water into that tank. Then we want to put some chemicals in there to help decompose anything that might be left and make it smell nice. Our gray tank is where our shower and sink water go, whether it be from the bathroom or the kitchen. That valve can stay open all the time as long as we have our hose hooked up at the campground. We can let that water flow out constantly. If we don't have the hose hooked up, we need to leave that valve closed until we get to a dump station to be able to empty it out. We'll notice on our unit, we do have a slide out. This is cable driven. We have a cable here at the bottom and top on both sides. That's how we identify what it is. And it is a 12 volt operated unit. If you want more information on that particular system, we have it in our helpful hacks section on the YouTube channel. We also have our furnace outlet right here. This furnace outlet is where our exhaust for our furnace is gonna come from. It is gonna get hot when operated, so be aware of that. Here on the rear of our unit, we have our factory supply ladder to be able to have access to our roof. This is important because we need to check our roof after trips and make sure no low-lying tree limbs have scraped or put holes in our rubber up there. And we also need to check our sealants on our roof every 60 to 90 days. And we need to check our sealants on our walls, around our windows, our lights, our trim pieces, anything like that where there is sealant, we need to check that every 60 to 90 days. This is required by the manufacturer to keep you in warranty. If you don't do that and some openings pop up and you end up getting water entry, manufacturers will not participate in that type of repair. This is considered owner maintenance, customer maintenance, okay? Just like changing the oil in your car, this is what's gonna keep your camper going for years to come. On the rear, we also have our storage piece right here. If we pull this cover off, that is where we can store our sewer hose for our unit rather than having to keep it in the front compartment, all that nastiness in there. Here we have our 30 amp twist lock plug. This twist lock plug just inserts, we turn it to the right to kind of lock it in and we wanna make sure we put that retainer ring nice and tight. That way that plug doesn't come out and cause any arcing or anything on there. When we plug that in, we wanna plug that in first and then plug into our campsite. Otherwise we'll have some arcing when we connect it together. And we also want to make sure that our AC is off on our unit before we plug all that in to make sure we don't have any spikes in power on our compressor. This will help our AC last a whole lot longer too. We'll also find on our rear towards the bottom a small receiver hitch. This is not for towing. This is if you want to add a little carriage or something and pull behind you while you're traveling down the road for some extra storage, so on and so forth. They have the little carriages you can put in that receiver hitch for extra storage. We also have our Keystone camera ready system pre-wired up here. If we wanna purchase a backup camera and install on there, we can add the mount monitor in our truck and we can see what's behind us when we're backing up or traveling down the road. On our passenger side of our unit, of course, we have our pass-through bay with a light right here on this side. Not much to go over in that pass-through over here. We also have our awning right here. Our awning is a 12 volt powered awning. If we have any issues, we want to go to that fuse panel on the inside. We'll go over later to check the fuse for that. Our awning is a sunshade only, not a rain shade. So that means if we have weather coming in, any light rain, heavy rain, wind, anything like that, we need to roll that awning in. If we are leaving our campsite for a, even a short period of time, we want to roll that awning in. This is because if any damage happens to that awning, it's gonna become an insurance claim. If it's due to water, rain, anything, if it's due to water, wind, or any damage like that, that awning is not gonna be covered by the manufacturer. So that is very important. We take care of our awning and we use it properly. Another thing we need to do is pitch our awning either to the front or the rear to allow runoff. This means any dew that we have on the camper, condensation from the AC, all that is probably gonna end up on our awning. So in the event that it does, wanna pitch it so that water can run off and it doesn't puddle on our awning. Real easy to do, we can do it from our front awning arm or our rear awning arm, wherever we want that runoff to go. We grab it right here in the middle, we pull it down and it pitches our awning. We don't have to do it a lot, just enough for that water to be able to run off. When we're ready to roll our awning in, 
we simply just push it back up and straighten out that awning. We can retract it. Under our awning, we'll notice we have an LP Quick Connect down here at the bottom. That LP Quick Connect is hooked to your propane tanks on the front so you can put a gas grill or something out here and be able to cook under your awning. We'll notice on our door, we do have a friction controlled entry door. So that means we're gonna feel a little resistance on that door. That is to prevent the wind from slamming that door open or closed. So that's a nice feature to have. We wanna to notice too on our solid steps that we have right here, when we level our unit, we are leveled it left to right and front to back. The next thing we wanna level is our steps. So first of all, we can store them by putting them up into the frame, we wanna give it a little tug, make sure those steps are stored in there nice and good and this clip is catched on the frame. When we wanna bring it down, we pull that blue lever, make sure our entry door is all the way open and we can drop our steps down. So to level them, we have a little silver tab right here. If we push that tab in, we can operate our legs up and down. This will allow us to level our steps where we need them. So right now we have our steps almost level. Click that, that leg will come out and we're level right here. And we can notice right here we're level. So another thing we need to take into account is if our steps aren't level, our entry door will hit the steps on the frame and on the bottom of our door frame and it will cause damage right there. We also need to make sure it's level because our door won't close properly because this threshold is sticking up. So avoid damage, level your steps after you level your unit. We do have a spare tire on our unit. If we lift our steps up, we notice there's a hole right here in the J-wrap. Our spare tire is right under there. We'll use one of our cranks that came with the unit and we can lower the spare tire to be able to have access to that. We also have outdoor speakers mounted up top that is controlled by your radio on the inside with one of the zones. We have our key TV system. This is for our outdoor TV. We have our mounting location for our bracket for that outdoor TV. And we also have our 110 outlet to be able to operate that as well. Behind our tires right here, looking under the underbelly, you'll see a red and blue line with valves on it. That is your low point drains. This is what we wanna open up to drain the water out of our system when we're preparing for winterization. As we walk into the entry door, we can see our control center. From here, we can see a meter right here off to the right. If we hold down our battery, our fresh tank, our black tank, and our gray tanks, we can see the levels. Now, this is a generic panel, so we're gonna have multiple black tanks and gray tanks on the meter, but you only have one on your system. Now, also notice below that, we have our water pump. If we remember from our fresh tank, if we don't have a city water connection where we're at, we have that fresh tank with water in it, we kick that water pump on and that will bring us water to our fixtures. Now, if we are using city water or we're empty on our tank, we wanna make sure we turn that water pump off then whenever not in use. Our porch right here, this is for our porch lights under our awning. Our ceiling does our interior lights. And of course we have our slide out right here, in and out, that's a cable driven slide and our awning in and out there. Next, we'll go over the operation of our AC right below it. Here we have our Furion thermostat. This controls our air conditioner system in the living room area. We would hold that button down and it will eventually light up that display and it would go ahead and initiate our AC system. We can see our first option we'll start with at that mode center is our cool option. We'll start with our cool option first. Our cool will cool the air throughout our unit. We of course sit our thermostat to whatever point we want it to be. And we have our fan speed options. We have low and high. For low and high, that fan will run all the time. Now, whenever we want that fan to cut off, whenever the compressor cuts off, much like we likely do at home, we have it on auto. That system will shut off and on with the compressor. Our next mode is our heat mode. Our heat mode activates our gas powered furnace on our unit. We choose our set point and our heater will come on whenever necessary. There is fan speeds on here, but it does not change the fan speed on that furnace. It is a single fan speed on there controlled by the furnace board. Our next mode is our fan mode. Our fan mode simply circulates air throughout our unit without cooling it or anything. This will come out of our rooftop air and we can just change from high to low to control that 
fan speed if we wish. That fan will stay on the entire time when we have it in our fan mode. Our last mode is our dry mode. Our dry mode is like a dehumidifier. We can choose our set point and it will cool our unit down to that set point and it will continue to cool past that but alternate every six to 10 minutes off and on. That way it doesn't drop that temperature too low and freeze you out of the unit, but it still dries the air in your unit. Another thing to note with our furnace is that the air is gonna come out of the vents on the floor. It's not gonna come out of the rooftop air. Your only rooftop air is gonna be your fan and your cool and your dry. Your heat will come out of those floor vents from the furnace. Down at the bottom near our entry door, we do have a little floor light right here, operational by that switch next to our AC thermostat. And to the left of it, we have our CO and LP detector. That detector is going to let us know if we have any gases in here, and it'll go off and let us know we need to evacuate our unit. This is a 12-volt operated safety device. That green light down at the bottom of this one lets us know that we do have power to our unit. We need to hold down that test button and check it every month to ensure that that system is working properly as well as our smoke detector. Our smoke detector is powered by a nine volt battery just like your one at home. So we need to check and make sure the operation of that is right as well. These do have an expiration on it. You can see it on the front. If it's not on the front, you'll have to unscrew it and check it on the back. Usually five to seven years they're good for and you need to change it out. Not much in our front bedroom. We do have some storage under our bed. We also have a mounting location for a TV in here and we have our key TV system for our satellite and cable hookup that will go straight to our TV. Our cable will go to our TV. We can scan for cable or antenna channels on there and our satellite would go to a receiver first then to our TV. Now key TV system for our old school campers that are used to the push button between antenna and cable for that boost that push button is no more with a key TV system. You can automatically swap between cable and antenna and scan for channels without having to worry about turning off that TV boost. We also have these travel straps on all of our doors that these pocket doors want to make sure we have those travel straps on whenever in travel so our doors don't come off the rail. Our dinette booth can drop down and add more sleeping area. We could do this by pulling it out. We do have a little latch right here. You pull that yellow tab and then we pull our table from left to right to collapse it and get it to drop down to pull it back up we pull it up left to right and lock it into place above our dinette we have our connects tv this is an am fm radio and bluetooth so rather than having an actual radio system somewhere in your unit all your stuff will be controlled from here and this will also control your outside speakers as well as your indoor speakers above that we have our wine guard lte wi-fi system if we upgrade to add a router on there that will boost our Wi-Fi that we may purchase at our campground or we can get a cell phone provider and get a SIM card to put into that router and we can purchase that Wi-Fi whenever we're on the road, wherever they have service. In our living room, we'll notice we have our ceiling assembly for our AC. That AC has a dump valve. This dump valve will allow air to just push out of the ceiling assembly in our living room area if we want to cool that off quickly. If we want to flow through our ducts in our unit like this that run all through our ceiling and spread that air out, we want to close that off. Otherwise, it will not blow out of that ductwork. We also have a vent right here. This is our intake. It does have a filter on there. We want to check that every so often and make sure that filter is clean so we're not restricting our AC. So here we are in our bathroom. Our shower is going to be pretty cut and dry. We have our hot and cold faucets here. But on our shower head, we have a lever right here that can turn this shower head off and on. So it's convenient when we're dry camping, we're trying to conserve the amount of water that we're putting into our gray tank system, as well as the amount of water we're using from our fresh tank system. So the way it works is we find our sweet spot on our faucet, we shower up, get all wet, and then we can turn it off right here without having to worry about turning it off at our faucets down here. We lather up with soap, then we kick it back on to rinse off. We don't have to worry about trying to find that sweet spot. Like I said, simple off and on. Now we'll give you a tip if you do decide to use this, whenever you go to kick it back on, point that shower head at the wall because that quick first burst of water coming out of there is gonna be a little chilly. If you're using a city water connection, 
fine. You don't have to worry about that shower head. You have a place to drain your gray water and you have all the water you need out of that city water connection. You can use it like normal. So our RV toilet, we talked about it with our black tank system. RV toilet paper only. Don't use anything else. It won't decompose properly. Now a couple things we need to know about our toilet system. For doing number one, we're just putting liquids in there. We can just hit that pedal, flush it away. For doing number two, we're going to hold that pedal down just a little bit and we want to let water fill that bowl up about halfway, maybe three quarters of the way. And we're just making sure that ball valve at the bottom stays closed while we're filling it up with water because the solids that we put in there, you're going to need water to help flush that down the pipes. Otherwise, you could end up with clogging or anything like that for that system. Once again, your waste and your toilet paper, the only things that go into that toilet. Otherwise, you could cause some issues with drainage out of that tank. Over here we have our GFCI. That GFCI is going to cover some of the outlets like our outside outlet, our outlet in here, maybe some of the ones in our kitchen. We do have a GFCI in our kitchen uh, separate from this one, so that one will control our kitchen outlets over there. But what a GFCI does is it, it protects wet outlet locations. If it were to get wet, it's going to trip the breaker on this outlet itself versus the breaker on your breaker panel. So if that happens, we come over here, we hit that reset button on here, and that will reset that outlet and bring power back to those items. It can also be tripped if we hook too many griddles, coffee pots, any blow dryers, anything like that, too much amperage will trip that system out. So you'll notice if we hit the test button on here, we'll have a little orange light indicating that it is faulted. All we have to do, once again, hit that reset button and it will reset and restore power to those outlets. We also have our Gerard water heater right here. This is our controller for that. We'll hit the operation on that now. Here we have our Gerard tankless water heater control. We have our Celsius Fahrenheit button right here at the top left to swap between the two types of temperature. We have our on off button and we have our up and down that will change the temperature that we have set for our unit. Now, once we initiate our hot water, you'll see a couple of things happen. You'll see our temperature up here change to our output temperature, which is the temperature of the water coming out of our tankless water heater system. We'll also see a shower head icon at the bottom right that shows that water is in use. And then we'll see our fan icon on the bottom left lets us know that our tankless water heater system is initiating. Once we see the flame that pops up in the middle of our unit, that means that our system is actually heating that water and we'll see that temperature begin to increase. Now these systems only run for 20 minutes before going into a shutoff mode. In the event that you're still using hot, hot water after that point, just turn the hot water off and turn it back on and it will reinitiate and begin to heat water again. So in our kitchen area, we'll notice we have another GFCI outlet over here in the corner. Once again, that's going to control our kitchen outlet. So if those aren't operating, we want to go there first and reset that breaker on there. <clears throat> we'll notice we have our standard microwave right here. This is the vent top that we were talking about earlier on the outside of this slide. You have that vent you want to open up if you ever use this vent. Kick it on and it'll exhaust out. We also have a light under here that we can use on our three burner stove top. You do have a glass plate on here that you can use for more counter space. And this is also the travel position whenever you're hitting the road, you want it in that position. When we use our three burner stove top, we kick that glass panel up and we can choose which burner we want. Turn it to the igniter flame right there. Hit our igniter knob to the left and we'll have that burner light up. Now, one thing we want to know about our stove is it's the perfect place to go bleed air out of our LP system. Now, this is going to happen when we've stored our unit, we've turned our tanks off. You're going to end up with air in those lines. This is very common and okay to happen. Uh, it can also happen when we change our tanks out on our propane system. So I always suggest campers, you're in that event where you're likely going to have air in your system. First thing you want to do before you go activate your water heater or your furnace or anything like that to avoid those items going into a fault because of the air in the system, come to your stovetop, light one or two of these burners and let it run until you get a nice blue crisp flame on there. No orange poppy flames and you'll have likely gotten all the air out of that system. Then go operate your other gas appliances. Now our oven down below is going to work just like our stovetop. We have our knob off to the right. We turn it to that flame ignition spot 
and we're going to have to hold that knob down and then turn our igniter knob right here. We're going to have a spark down there by the thermocouple and that's going to light our pilot. Now, even though we bled air out of our system the first time you light that, it is still going to take a little while and you may use a long stem lighter just because it's easier. But once that pilot has lit, then you want to hold it for 30 to 60 seconds, warm up that thermocouple while still pushing your knob down right here. And once we think it's there, we turn it to the appropriate temperature that we want and that burner tube will light up. Now, if that pilot goes out whenever you turn it to the temperature, just turn it back to the flame, push the button, and then reignite it, hold it down for a little longer and try it again. That just means that thermocouple hasn't warmed up enough. We do have a switch off to the right that will light up our knobs. If we go down one more, that'll light up the knobs in our oven. And we'll notice when we turn our knobs on with these lights on or not, we'll have a red indicator around that ring. That is letting us know that that knob is active and it is allowing gas to come out. So it's a nice safety feature. If the kids accidentally hit it or anything, you notice that knob is red, you need to get over there and turn it off if that burner isn't being used. Here we have our Furion 12 volt refrigerator. That refrigerator is operational by a little knob down here we can turn from cold to colder or off. Now important thing that we need to know is that this is gonna pull off of our battery. So anytime we have that disconnect on, this is gonna operate unless we have it to that off position. Now I suggest whenever storing your camper, you turn it to the off position or disconnect your battery, whatever. And then we need to defrost our unit. You're gonna build up with some ice in this freezer section. You wanna wipe all that down after it defrosts and get any water out of there. Same thing with our refrigerator area here. Get the moisture out of there, let everything dry out. This will prevent mold and mildew in both of those boxes. And also it will prevent any water from leaking out of here when it does defrost and damaging any wood around your refrigerator that's not going to be covered under warranty. These are airtight gaskets, not watertight. So defrost that freezer, get all the water out of there. They don't have drain tubes in here, so it will damage the components around that refrigerator and not be covered under warranty. Here in the kitchen to the left of our sink cabinet, we have our breaker panel. This is our breaker panel for our 110 items. We can see them labeled right here off to the side. And if we are ever tripped, we don't have any operation on our 110, we want to come here and check that first. Here we have our 12 volt fuses for our 12 volt operated devices. We can see they're all labeled right here. We would come here and check these blade fuses to see if any of that is tripped. Below this, we see this kind of grid. We may hear a little fan running back there. That is our converter system. That converter is changing voltage from 110 to 12 volts when we're plugged in and it is essentially a battery charger charging up our battery while we're plugged in. Well, we hope you found that resourceful, but wait, there's more information on our Great American RV YouTube channel. This channel right here, find the playlist HAPS Helpful Hacks. We go over different products in this unit and we'll take a deeper dive with more diagnostics, more information, as well as helpful tips when you're out camping. Tell your buddies, tell your friends, like, share, subscribe, do all those awesome things on YouTube, TikTok, wherever you found us. And keep watching here at Great American RV Superstores, where we bring the how-to to you.